Okay, uh, thanks for waiting. Good to see everybody. My name is Troy Swanson. I'm the library department chair. This is a special panel discussion about um, the book Seek You and American Loneliness. This is um, our book for the year for our One Book, One College program. And the idea of loneliness is um, a theme within that book. And so um, we have some experts here to talk about their disciplines and just to give us ideas on how we might understand a loneliness and uh, particularly uniquely American loneliness, which I'll talk about in a second. But before I get too far into that, I want to give our panel members a second to just introduce themselves. Maybe just tell us your name and what departments you teach in. So, uh, Dr. Amani. Get a little closer. Dr. Amani was was, and I teach in the Communications and Literature Department. Hi, I'm Tish Hayes. I'm the Information Literacy Librarian here in the library. Hi, uh, my name is Sandra Beauchamp. I'm an uh, instructor in the Communications and Literature Department in Moraine Valley. Hi, I'm Dr. Aaron Smith. I'm a philosophy professor. Awesome, thank you all. And this is a fun group, so I'm excited to hear everyone's ideas. Just to get us started, as I mentioned, um, we're talking about American loneliness. This is from the one book, um, Seek You. And this kind of related idea of kind of um, American individualism, rugged individualism, what does it mean to be an individual? I, I think that's really what we're after with this panel. Sorry, I keep saying loneliness, but it's the individual side. But she kind of identifies these three things, right? Self-reliance, independence, and personal responsibility, which on the face of it seems like maybe not such bad things. Um, she talks, she draws, and this is like, she makes a really complicated argument with this rugged individualism and putting it in the the um, context of loneliness. So I'm only gonna just touch on this briefly. So I encourage you, you can get the book at the bookstore, you can check this out from us. So you know, definitely it's worth a read. Um, and she ties this back to the whiskey drinking cowboy on the range, right? And I won't read all of this, but just as a couple points, um, you know, a cowboy's job is to keep himself on the trail, cooking gristled meat over the fire, sips from his tin cup and gazes at the unspoiled sky out before him, right? And it's always typically a him. Um, he doesn't rely on the in inconvenient confines of uh, government or townships or even living in civilization, just out into the world. Um, she pulls this into this, I this idea that we are self-reliant, but we're also kind of trapped by that self-reliance. Um, this bootstrap pulling, frontier cockering, make it on our own, um, uh, I ideologues that are at the foundation of what it means to be American, is, is her quote, right? And then this gets pulled in, this imagery gets pulled into our politics. And she pulls up, this is a, a reproduction of an actual uh, you know, uh, poster from Ronald Reagan running for president, right? Kind of the Western cowboy. Um, the myth of the Old West, strong and silent cowboy was so intoxicating to Anglo America that it, it successfully sold cigarettes and presidents, which I think is kind of a great thing. Um, so, and, uh, but she also makes a point, sorry, um, and I won't read it again, but just the, that really what happened to the cowboy was that barbed wire and the growth of, of civilization removed the cowboy. And the farm hand working on the farm became kind of the less sexy um, and you know version of the cowboy. And then that fades, fades away into this mythology where the cowboy is left and the reality is devoid of where, uh, you know, we're, we're separated from the reality. So her argument is this idea of rugged individualism to frontier mythology. This mythology becomes magnified through pop culture, such as, you know, Rick Grimes from The Walking Dead, and also pulled into politics. Um, this extends the kind of isolation that we live away from other people, because we think that's what it means to be an American. I don't need you. We're not really part of a society. We are rugged individualists. Um, and then also, um, and I didn't get into this too much with the images, but she really does connect us into this masculine idea that does tie us into some of the violence we see in our society and the objectification, especially of women and, and others along the way, right? So some of the kind of dangers of, of that side of American culture. So that's the setup. That's what we want to kind of get into through different perspectives of our expert panel. So um, our individualism is a part of the loneliness that pervades our culture. So. With that, I am happy to turn things over to Sandra to take us down an exciting path about rugged individualism. Uh, so I wanted to explore from my disciplinary perspective where this concept of rugged individualism came from. Where did it start? And so I wanted to go back to the very foundations of our nation, um, and that is the age of colonialism, where we have people 
coming to uh, America and, and uh, the pilgrims came in the 1620s um, and then a decade later we have the Puritans that followed the Puritans fared a little bit better but they were seeking a place where they could um, practice their beliefs apart from the Church of England. Um, they were not necessarily prepared for the harsh world that they would encounter and we see that there were many of the many of the literary figures, the historical figures, who would long for uh, what they had always called home. So that the Puritans believed that they had an independent connection with God, and they did not need an intermediary in order to help them understand God. So the Puritans enjoyed a high level of, of literacy, a high rate of literacy, and they believed in education. Um, so one of the one of the literary figures that I, I want to talk about is Anne Bradstreet, who it came to the came to with her family and her husband uh, to America to the colony uh, when she was just 18 years old. She married at 16 and left her beloved home uh, to come with her family here. Um, imagine that being 18, being married, and leaving behind everything that you knew, and and her father was um, a, you know, a, a political figure. She had access to libraries and a life of, of comfort. And she comes to this world where there's none of that. Um, and then she goes on to have eight children. And somehow, during that time, she's able to write. And she becomes the first poetic voice of America. And she reveals to you know everyone what her life is like, and it's filled with a struggle of, of faith, um, of loneliness. Her husband was often far away, and she is raising eight children. And yet, in this um, setting, she's able to find time to write and to express herself. So this theocracy that is set up gives way eventually to a more secular form of individualism, and we enter the age of enlightenment, or the age of reason. Um, enter the figures of Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Benjamin Franklin. And so these figures became very interested in formally making themselves independent from England because of taxation without representation. We all know that, that story. Um, and they set out they had a revolution Thomas Jefferson, who was only 33 years old at the time, penned the Declaration of Independence. These were a young group of, of men and, and women, right, who were trying to formally separate themselves from England. And the figure that represents this age of individualism, I think, is Benjamin Franklin. Um, he is the archetype of the self-made man. Um, he set out his life to be continuously improving. He wasn't a perfect man, and he admitted that in his autobiography. Um, but, and he was a gregarious man, outgoing, but he demanded solitude so that he would be able to do all these things, invent, to debate, to educate, to read, which he loved to do. And he became known as a, a diplomat and a success story, right? Individual, self-made, pull yourself up by your bootstraps archetype. Um, and then, so we write the Constitution, and in it we have the words of liberty, freedom, right, for all. But we know that wasn't necessarily the case, right? We had to wait decades more um, for that to be fully realized for the rest of the citizens of what would be the United States. So we move from the framers of the Constitution um, who put into place this political system, right? We move from that to the age of romanticism. And so the framers, they believed in individualism, but they also kind of wanted to make sure that citizens were constantly giving back to their community. They underscored the importance of, yes, we are individuals, but we work toward the one, out of many, one, right? So we enter the age of romanticism, and this idea of individualism shifts just a bit. 
in this age, we have an elevation of the individual over society. The importance is on, on the individual, the imagination, self-realization, non-conformity. And so the voices that we hear are Ralph Waldo Emerson, the transcendentalist essayist, right? Who writes the essay, Self-Reliance. And then we have um, Thoreau and the idea of rebelling against the status quo. Um, so we have this era where we're moving away from, you know, even though we, we still have groups that are, that are working for abolition uh, and women's rights, um, there is an emphasis on the individual spirit and that being somewhat more, taking more precedence over um, the community. Um, then we move to the Civil War, which tore our nation in two. And it was over a definition of what freedom meant, what identity meant, what individualism meant. Um, and it took a while for, and some would say, we're still working on putting our country back together after that divisive conflict. We move to the age of modernity. And we see yet another shift in this idea of um, individualism, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? And the, the author that I highlight here is F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, who wrote The Great Gatsby. And so the title character is this character who comes from nothing. He is impoverished and he has this plan. He has this schedule, just like Ben Franklin had, by the way. And he has this schedule and he's determined to follow it, to forge his own destiny, to make his own way. What happens? He meets a young lady named Daisy, right? And the war, World War I happens. What happens to his dream? It becomes altered. Um, he, he, his dream becomes corrupted in many ways. And in order to reach the end, um, he does things perhaps that the original um, James Gatz wouldn't have done. Um, and therein lies the tragedy of the story. Um, so it's interesting, I think, that we go from this, this individualism of the colonialism and what that meant to the 1920s, the age of modernity, and we see that definitely changing. I'm running out of time. You're good. Okay, okay. And then, um, so that takes us to, to CQ, right? And, and we're following this change of rugged individualism, the idea that you should be able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps to be an individual. But the one thing that I kept noticing throughout all of these eras is the shifting meaning of individualism, but also the fact that there is a sacrifice involved on behalf of these individuals um, in order to have something that they thought was important like freedom um, they had to give something up um, and this is continually the case for every era and i think that we see ourselves doing that now um, we there is a cost for um, you know our, our freedom there's a cost for our privacy in many ways and uh, and as uh, radke tells us and shares that is sometimes debilitating loneliness, and that in itself has consequences, the form of mental health and physical health. So I think it's interesting that this isn't necessarily a new concept, but it's something that I've seen and traced changing over, over the centuries. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, next we move to Amani. Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here. And Sandra, that was lovely, thank you so much. So I wanna begin by saying that according to biographer Timothy Sandifer, one of Frederick Douglass's many biographers, Douglass liked to think of himself as a self-made man. Douglas taught himself to read and elevated himself to become a prominent African-American orator. Douglas lived by the values of American individualism, 
a belief that prized self-reliance and self-development. It is Douglass's political thought, his embracing of American individualism that should guide our studies, argues Sandifer. The biographer critiques the overabundant focus on Douglass's personal heroic story. However, this personal heroic story, I suggest, is informed by the same narrative that privileges American individualism that Sandifer prizes. The two narratives, the heroic story and the story of Douglas as an individualist are told with the aim to depict Douglas as the heroic embodiment of American individualism. It helps to keep in mind that Douglas wrote not one but three autobiographies written under different historical circumstances from 1845 to 1892. Douglas's autobiographies show significant revisions that showcase his complicated relationship to the heroic story that privileges individualism. Douglas wrote his first narrative under strict, quote, confining parameters of abolitionist conventions, as scholar Celeste Marie Bernier suggests. The Douglas of 1845 was put on theatrical display of himself as seemingly, quote, exemplary, almost superhuman. The abolitionists required, quote, thrilling narratives of a heroic identity based upon moments of resistance. Abolitionists desired for writers to create narrations of theatrical displays. And Douglas, quote, dramatized visual spectacles of himself as larger than life, a larger than life paragon of black masculinity. As an orator, Frederick Douglass consciously displayed his body, physical movements, and voice in carefully studied ways to represent the ideals of proper and virtuous American orator. In his extensive study, scholar Robert Fenucci explains how the tall and muscular and well-spoken Frederick Douglass troubled white audiences who equated fine oratory with white men. According to Finucci's summary of David Laverne's ideas, quote, his oratory involved the public use of his body in a way that pointedly ignored the entitlements of individualism, which American society poised to offer bourgeois white males. Douglas consciously had to carefully present the ways that he was photographed Never smiling and always staring at the camera, Frederick Douglass aimed to communicate that neither he nor the African American community were content with their condition in America, according to writer David Walker. Douglass did not just aim to have control over his photographed image. He wanted control over his very own writing. Thus, in his last autobiography written in 1881 and revised in 1892, Douglas revises his narrative aims. He is still a hero, but his heroism stems from, quote, not these moments of resistance, sudden moments of resistance, but upon endurance in the face of everyday struggle. Key to her understanding of Douglas is Bernier's insistence that he and his community are not separate. As Bernier argues, he works hard to, quote, educate post-emancipation black audiences regarding a hidden history of black communal resistance during slavery. Douglas also includes significant passages that celebrate the power of African-American oral traditions and oral narratives of his community and family. Scholar Valerie Babs, Babb argues that this inclusion of traditions, quote, validate the cultural legitimacy of his African-American antecedents. 
even as he glorified the concept of men working hard to raise themselves out of harsh circumstances in his important speech, Self-Made Men, Douglas insisted on African Americans being given the opportunity to excel. He stated, the nearest approach to justice to the Negro for the past is to do him justice in the present, throw open to him the doors of the schools, the factories, the workshops, and of all mechanical industries for his own welfare. Give him the chance to do whatever he can do well. Douglas goes on to reaffirm his belief in individualism, but it is an individualism that is rooted in interdependence and the presence of others. Douglas once spoke, I believe in individuality, but individuals are to the mass like waves to the ocean. We differ as the waves, but are one as the sea. How fascinating that Douglas would use the sea and waves as metaphors for the oneness and independence of humanity. For, his, for this academic year, the Moraine Valley Library has chosen for its one book, one college, Kristen Radke's CQ, A Journey Through American Loneliness. And in her book, Radke depicts loneliness as a drowning and speaks at length about American individualism engendering loneliness in men. By its nature, I suggest, slavery capitalized on loneliness to break the souls of the kidnapped and enslaved Africana people. Authors David Blight and William Andrews speak of du Frederick Douglass's very own loneliness when he escaped slavery. His loneliness pushed him to seek community, and unfortunately for a while, during the writing of his very first narrative, he became dependent on white abolitionists who constricted his freedom. A discussion of Frederick Douglass would not be complete without discussion of his loneliness. In 2019, David Walker and his cohorts created a graphic narrative of Douglass's life story to make his life story readily available to wider audiences. In the graphic narrative, Douglas's loneliness bears the imprint of the loneliness expressed by the others who were enslaved in his very own community. Douglas himself insists he was not a hero. His story was not exceptional. And this was the narrative that the abolitionists attempted to be enforced on him. As long as he lived, he would continue to fight for his community, which he explained, as you could see up there, they were drowning in slavery and there was no way he could rest while others were drowning in slavery. For after all, since each individual is like a wave in the ocean and we are one with the sea, that very same individuality cannot function while others are drowning. Thanks, Amani. Wow, that's so much there and uh, really powerful ideas. And even just at a glance, I, I wish we had more time because just the connections between um, your points about uh, control of image, the heroism and endurance, it seems like there's such a pathway there to Gadsby, right? Like just like such connections. So maybe we can touch on some of that. Uh, but before we get to that, I do want to um, bring up Tish. Thanks. And the clicker is right there to go first. Um, and thank you to both of you. Um, I feel like setting up where I wanna go um, with my part of this uh, talk. Um, just thinking about um, Frederick Douglass wanting his own narrative to like have that nuance and complexity of individuality and collectivism, but really, um, kind of a very forceful push towards that individualism that we value as Americans. And I think that's why I wanted to start with this definition of hegemony, um, which is social or cultural predominance or ascendancy. Um, 
so a set of cultural or social ideas and ways of doing things to the exclusion of others. And I think individualism counts as hegemony um, in America. Um, we might also think of it as a dominant paradigm, a paradigm as a set of concepts and patterns that explains how things should work. And that these are things, and this, both of these terms I think are like well outside of my actual disciplinary expertise, but I think it's important to talk about them because I think individualism isn't just a choice that we make, it is something that is part of how we grow into ourselves as Americans. So if we grow up in this culture, we, like from the very beginning, we are taught that we should be self-reliant, that those things are valued. Um, like I remember graduating from high school and feeling like, oh, it's now on me to do all of the work, to, to, to figure it all out by myself. And I think we, especially here, watch a lot of people struggle with that um, for lots of good reasons. So it's something that like, it's hard to escape from. And ideas that are hegemonic, um, that are part of a dominant paradigm, make it really hard to, like it shapes how we see the world, and so it shapes what we think, it shapes the choices that we make, but it also um, uh, structures all of the things that we do, including the ways in which we um, gather together, the ways we might try to resist against um, individualism. So as the information literacy librarian, I help students with research, um, thinking about how to come up with topics, how to think about topics. Often students are asked to um, come at a topic in multiple directions, or maybe you know find a topic where there's a pro and a con. And one of the things that I think is really complicated about research um, that needs a lot of time and attention is that we we want to think about like whose voices aren't here the things like when you do a Google um, Lots of things come up, but often it's the same kinds of information So when we are looking at a narrative or we're looking at a topic What isn't there who isn't represented and that who isn't represented is an important starting point for finding counter narratives and finding other ideas outside of a paradigm. So I wanna talk a little bit about some examples of those things. So um, Sandra was talking about the beginning of our country. Um, and I do think we all think of Benjamin Franklin. We think of these iconic figures. And right alongside them, we have people who are definitely not um, in those positions of wealth and power and we're fighting to get representation, they were fighting for their rights as workers. So the American labor movement began as the country began. As, as long as there were workers, there were people fighting against owners or, or looking to find um, representation for themselves. Um, and so it's, and I'm not a labor historian, so I'm not gonna dive too deep into that. There's an excellent <laughs> Wikipedia pages um, if you want a, a brief overview. Um, but what I find is really interesting is that alongside so we have like the dominant paradigm, so Ben Franklin. Um, we have a counter narrative, which is the American labor movement. But even within that counter narrative, the way we look at and view history, we don't always see all of the different parts of that labor movement. Um, so I wanted to highlight this book, The Untold History of American Labor, um, because she also goes back to the beginning of the country, looks at the history of the labor movement, but starts pulling out the, the stories of women, immigrants, um, people of color, um, sex workers, the kinds of folks that often aren't included in our histories, in any of our histories, um, but even the labor movement. Um, and we, by focusing on those kinds of histories, we do get to see a picture that like helps us move past um, this idea of individualism. So the, the labor movement, although required, of course, solidarity among workers, often stopped at, um, like, I wanna improve things for me and mine. And some of these other groups, so again, immigrants, women, were looking at, <laughs> at this and being shut out then of that labor movement. And they're saying, well, actually, like if we work a little bit harder and get everyone together, maybe we can make things better for all of us. And that, that perspective of all of us, I think, helps shift us out of that dominant paradigm. So another place where that happens 
Um, oh, I almost forgot about this quote. So we can think about this shifting the dominant paradigm also when we think about um, social movements. Um, so this applies to the labor movement, it applies to feminist movement, it applies to the LGBTQ movement. Um, and so there's this amazing feminist, Marie um, Matsuda, and this quote, the way I try to understand the interconnection of all forms of subordination is through a method I call, ask the other question. When I see something that looks racist, I ask, where is the patriarchy in this? When I see something that looks sexist, I ask, where is the heterosexism, heterosexism in this? When I see something that looks homophobic, I ask, where are the class interests in this? And I think this idea that all of these things are interconnected helps, again, us think about and push against the dominant paradigm. So the feminist movement has done extraordinary things, again, since the very early beginnings of our country. But we know that white women got the vote to, got the right to vote much before black women, right? That the white feminist movement has often left out um, folks of all colors to gain the things that they needed and wanted. Um, so again, we're, it's a way that the dominant paradigm of individualism is infecting and affecting these social movements. So to have a truly revolutionary social movement, uh, something that really does push against individualism that, that encompasses solidarity and collectiv collectivism, um, we have to wait um, until we have some extraordinary black feminists who um, come together as the radical black feminist organization named the Combahee River Collective. They formed in 1974. They were named after, they named themselves after Harriet Tubman's 1853 raid on the Combahee River in South Carolina that freed 750 enslaved people. Um, so the collective was made up of um, a number of different kinds of women who identified as straight, as um, lesbian, um, different social circumstances or social economic circumstances. And they described the condition of black women um, as fighting oppressions on multiple fronts. They saw black women in isolation and wanted to use their writing to reach out and make connections. This idea of community and collectivism was really important. And they emphasized solidarity. So again, they, they identify themselves as separate and different from white feminists, recognizing that their solidarity with black men around race was really important because they couldn't themselves free themselves of their race. They couldn't just focus on their um, gender. Um, so that their struggle with black men um, was something that had to be central to the work that they were doing as well. And they are that group um, have this incredible statement that I think has traveled well past the 70s. I think I've seen it on social media even very recently. And that's if black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. And when we think about solidarity or a response to individualism, that idea that if we free the most um, oppressed, all of us get to be freer. And like, why aren't we doing that? Um, it seems like a natural a natural place to go. And then quickly, thinking about the future, once again, trying to get past this dominant paradigm. Um, we, again, our, our imaginations are often limited. So I am a huge fan of science fiction. I read all kinds of science fiction. But there is a kind of visionary science fiction um, that I think is represented in Octavia Butler, Ursula Le Guin, and there's like a whole slew of new writers who are taking this on where they are actively trying to imagine a future where we aren't bound by individualism, where we are focused on the collective and connections and that that is how, again, we get free. That is how we build a better future. It's how we make meaning in our world. Um, and it's exciting um, and it offers some possibility. And these are all potential ideas for moving past the dominant paradigm. Thank you, Tish. That's fantastic. And it, I think the, what a great contrast in this discussion to go from the Puritan ideal to the uh, Combahee River Collective. Like there's a spectrum and I 
and ideas that have continued to grow, maybe shared ideas, maybe not so shared ideas where we are so fantastic. There's something there to talk about when we get to that point, but we want to make sure we have time for Aaron. So I will turn it over to you. Um, as a philosopher, one of the things, uh, I mean, it's just part of my discipline's training is to just kind of look at assumptions and arguments. And just even within this basic idea of individuality, um, and this is just, it's so hard for us in the United States to sort of think about other ways of doing things, and I'll get to that in a second. But just like a basic premise is like, instead of thinking of myself as an individual first and then a member of a group second, we c I could just think of myself as a member of a group first and an individual second. Um, for me, like one of this, like one of the first times I had a real strong encounter with this, I was studying in Germany and uh, a guy who was living on the same dorm floor as I was, he was uh, he had grown up in uh, what, what had then been East Germany, and he had grown up, grown up under communism. And we were just talking, because I'd never met anyone who had grown up under communism. And he was just talking about like how he really actually thought it was better in communist. And this is such a, you're like, wait, what? You know, just having grown up in the United States, and yes, I question things, but that was still just a different perspective because the narrative of the, you know, East Germany was you had the Stasi and it was repressive and all these things were horrible. But one of the things he said is just like, he had this day in a train station um, where someone had fallen and no one was willing to help that person get up. This was in the city of Stuttgart, and uh, he was just there. And he had to like ran across like tracks, and he was the only one who helped. And he was just like, and for him, he had seen similar things happen when he was younger in Eastern Germany. And then everyone would be willing to help because everyone had this sort of collective sense that they were doing this together. And they just started like education was about the collective first, the state first, and then the individual second. And so he really associated that with sort of problems with sort of capitalism and individualism and isolation. So that just really stuck with me. So this is just sort of one alternative to this ideal of individuality is we could just focus on the collective. Of course, that's very hard to go from the ideal of individuality to collective. I, I'm not here to offer a solution to that. That's just endemic. Also, I just love the idea of connecting this to Puritanism, just because in philosophy, we, I can talk about the ideas of like the individual. We can locate them in history, in the Middle Ages. You can go back to Socrates and the way he thought about philosophy. You can also see this in the rise of the Protestant Reformation. But in the United States, I think, like, I mean, we're very good at a lot of things. And I think we've done very well at pushing this idea of rugged individualism very far. So I just like to kind of like maybe point your attention to the, the slides and just like this ideal of individuality where we have like self-reliance. And this is the things that like Troy and everyone else has been kind of getting at. You could be self-made and we're completely independent. Like you have self-responsibility, you do something. Like if you want to do something, you just go out and do it. If you need something, you just go out and get it. If you only work hard enough and, and put enough effort into something, you will succeed. You can be self-made. And then also one, as a philosopher, one thing I really notice is that there is moral virtue that's attached to success. Like you can, you will never find, like maybe I'm sure there's one book, but you won't find a book of like, the, the things I know about being homeless, like as like an instruction guide for like someone about like, but in fact, I think that would be pretty amazing and could teach us a lot if someone actually told us about what it means to be homeless and the, like the things they have to do. That would be a better guide for living than Elon Musk's top 10 ways I became <laughs> successful. But yet Elon Musk is given a, just a, a very large podium and uh, he's very interested in promoting himself as a virtuous person, as being self-made. But something else in this idea of being self-made is that it kind of, it hides in, in our sort of culture, the sort of basic point of like, like we think of rights. And if we look at our constitution in the very beginning of our country, almost all of our rights are formu uh, formulated as what we might call negative rights. They're like individuals being protected from a government. So like I, the government can't store soldiers in my house without my consent. I can't have, you know, try, like all of our Bill of Rights are almost all entirely negative. And those are individuals, freedoms against the government and like unwanted intrusion into my individual freedom. You could also c formulate rights in terms of the collective. You could think of them as entitlements. And there's lots of other ways to do this, but just in the very beginning of our country, we're sort of s charting this path of individuality. Um, let me. Th 
the problem with individuality is that we're cut off. And it also hides the sort of issues of individuality in the sense that no one is truly independent. It's just like the idea of being self-made is so just, for me, it's a little nauseating in the sense that one has parents, one has family, one has communities. And so the idea of being self-made neglects all of these things. But often those things, especially for like, you know, like men who are claiming, I am totally self-made and you have a family. Oh, wonderful. Who's taking care of the family? How are you produced? And so this ideal of the sort of self-made, self-achieving individual is neglects this idea that we're all fundamentally connected to other people, but then also it also neglects, neglects the ideal that we can ask for help, we can communicate with others, and we need others. It's not a moral failure to need another human being to help. It's not a moral failure to ask for help. It's not a moral failure to do things for others. And then yet, so often, it's put in that sort of uh, box. We also internalize the ideals of individuality. But the problem is, most of us can't achieve those. Like, I can't, I'm, I'm not gonna be Elon Musk wealthy. I am not going to pull myself up from my bootstraps. I am not going to do all these things. I'm not going to be the cowboy on the range. I am not gonna be s sexy, smoking cigarettes, st staring off into the sunset. Like, for me, like, I'm fundamentally connected to other people. But I want those things, right? Because that's the things that are sort of inculcated to, into us by like we're conditioned to want these sorts of things as the individual. And then yet, as an individual, I can't achieve those. So I'm lonely. And so for me, I think the sort of American ideal of individuality, especially in Radke's book, really kind of pushes this narrative that the sort of ideal of individ individuality, the downside of that fundamentally leads to loneliness. <coughs> And for me, I just, there's this whole long section of the book which is just about primate experiments, which I've, like, I know from talking about these sorts of things in philosophy classes and ethics classes, these, these experiments are, are, are horrific. But for me, like hiding behind this sort of cowboy ideal <coughs> is the sort of image of the primate going insane. And this image is basically, these were these, primates that were just basically kept in cages and they were basically like depriva uh, deprivation experiments where they were just kept in cages and unsurprisingly they all went insane and they all couldn't socialize with each other. They were lonely, depressed, upset, angry, murdering each other. They were doing all sorts of horrible things. But the sort of metaphor here for me is that hiding behind and underneath that sort of cowboy ideal is the primate going insane. And for me, just to really spell that out, that primate going insane is all of us. And this is a sort of, for me, the underneath the sort of American individual ideal is the, the sort of epidemic of loneliness, as Radke points out, but this is also this endemic thing. And I don't think it's my fault that I'm lonely. And yet, that's the ideal that we're told. Like, oh, if I'm lonely, it's my fault. I should just reach out. As opposed to seeing this problem of loneliness as just sort of like systematic or as an end result of the way in which we've formulated our rights, the institutions that we've set up. All of these sorts of parts of American society are sort of geared toward us as individuals and then not as us as part of a collective. In the text, you also have this wonderful just sort of image here of like if you at the very top it says meals for one, and then all of these people are just staring, not connecting. They're not looking at each other. They're sort of touching each other, but not really. And for me, this is just like a, a great image of this sort of endemic loneliness, like the meal for one. Like I remember take like sometimes I used to go out to dinner by myself and take a book or just like sit. And I had a friend who was just flabbergasted that, that I would do that. And you're like, what would you do? Wouldn't you be lonely? And, no, I'm not lonely. That's enjoyable. Like, I get to have some time by myself. And for me, this is also uh, a flip side to loneliness that we don't often get to, which is this idea of solitude. Like, you could have a meal for one, but a meal for one where you're looking for other people and desperately wanting human connection is really lonely. It's that eighth grade lunchroom experience where you want to talk to someone, but yet you can't overcome the social distance. <coughs> So the solutions, honestly, this is just really simple. Connect to others, right? I love when philosophers say, it's really simple. To, the, the solution to loneliness is to connect to others. Just go talk. And of course, that's, 
that's naive. It has a great bit of privilege attached to it. Uh, and also, I just want to highlight one of the problems with loneliness is, and overcoming loneliness, is needing to feel safe, is having psychological comfort. If you're really traumatized where you can't connect to other people, it's really hard to connect to other people. It's really easy to say, just go talk to someone else when you're able-bodied or you feel comfortable in yourself. And for a lot of people growing up in a society that promotes loneliness, those are things that are not easily given. So of course those things are needed. We also, as a philosopher, or as a philosopher, I also want to emphasize the need for self-knowledge, um, just like we have to know ourselves. But obviously, self-knowledge isn't enough. We have to accept ourselves. And finally, I just had to get this in. As a philosopher, I'm always accused of being a critic and not offering solutions. But for me, a solution to loneliness is solitude. It's just the state of being aware of being alone and not needing someone else. Like, you can be by yourself, and you can enjoy it, and that can be wonderful. It's very hard in our society, but yet that's something we can try to achieve. And I think I'm out of time, so thank you very much. All right, and that's great. Um, and this idea in you know that we live in this most connected time of human history in some ways, right? We're, but to still be alone in the crowd all the time, I think, is is one of the ironies. And I love the idea of the primate going insane. I mean, I don't love that. I, it, it's frightening, but it's such a phrase that captures so much. It connects back to that um, hegemony idea. So I want to pause. We are almost out of time, but I, since we have our audience members here, are there any questions? I want to turn to you first. Is there questions or comments that you'd like to offer? Points, great points. And the idea about who who's keeping us separate too also harkens back a little bit to Tish's point about the voices that are missing, like who benefits. And so, yeah, so it's it's great. So good. Thanks. Other comments? All right. Panel members, any final thoughts you want to offer before we wrap up? Thank you. I like <laughs> listening to all of you. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is great. Um, okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our panel members. And have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> and we have the, check our YouTube channel. There's a lot of discussions on there from not always about American individualism. Uh, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. Bless you, though. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I,
such good thinking, like you.